Lakshmi, and hello, everybody. I hope you're enjoying Finical Conclave so far. And welcome to this session on cash management for an evolving normal. My name is Christine Barry, and I'm a research director at IT Group. And I am thrilled to be moderating what I know is going to be a great discussion on a very important topic. As a research analyst, I speak with both uh, banks and corporate treasurers about some of the key challenges that they face and their strategies for overcoming them. During recent months, uh, as a result of the pandemic, the financial services industry has faced so many unplanned for challenges, but I truly believe that once all of this is behind us, uh, the industry is going to emerge so much stronger than ever before. We're already seeing strong rises in electronic payments and digital transactions in general. We're seeing higher levels of automation across both corporate and business banking, but banks still have to continue to monitor changes in customer needs and continue to demonstrate that high level of resiliency that they've shown over the past few months to quickly address any changes that are needed in the market. As we begin 2021, I see innovation and that focus on digital transformation really continuing to move forward. In fact, I'm seeing some key themes that are summarizing some of the highest priorities um, at banks across the globe continuing to move forward. First, we're seeing customers that are demanding much more system flexibility and integrated experiences. So all of those silos that exist need to come down and customers need to be presented with experiences, digital experiences that are unique to them. We're also going to see continued progress with uh, data, with analytics, with machine learning, not only to enable banks to have more intelligent engagement with their customers and better predict the types of capabilities or products they're going to need, but also to better arm customers with more data and tools to help them more effectively uh, forecast cash flows and just manage their liquidity positions and working capital. Speed and automation is also continue, going to continue to be a focus, especially with increased investment in onboarding and faster payments. And then finally, banks are going to continue to focus on improving that overall user experience, uh, not only within their bank portals, but they're going to increasingly see the importance of also integrating with external third-party solutions, as well as emerging fintechs. During today's session, we're going to discuss some key topics that are reshaping the cash management industry for good. You're going to hear about the impact of the pandemic on corporate customers and how banks' treasury services strategies have and will continue to evolve over the coming months. And for this, it is my pleasure to introduce to you our eminent group of panelists. First, we have Bert Vandry from Global Head of Cash Management and Liquidity at ING. We have Desiree Wolf, Director of Product Management at Webster Bank. And finally, Rahul Wadhafkar, Head of Product Management, North America at Infosys. Panelists, thank you so much for taking the time to be a part of today's panel. Uh, before we get started, we do have a, a couple of out housekeeping uh, notes. Uh, all of you in the audience, uh, you'll be muted throughout the session, but please feel free to submit questions through the Q&A panel. Uh, I will try my best to get to as many of those questions as possible toward the end of the discussion uh, during the Q&A session, but any questions that we don't get to, we will follow up with uh, later on. With that, I would love to kick things off, and Bert, we'll start with you with the first question. You know, if there's one thing we've really learned from the COVID-19 pandemic is that banks need to be agile and prepared to react and address unexpected challenges and client needs. What type of strategy does ING have in place uh, to help its clients navigate their cash management challenges, especially in this current environment that we face? Uh, thank you, Christine. It has been a year, eh? indeed. Uh, quite surprising, last nine months, 10 months. Um, and indeed, I think, uh, first of all, I can tell a bit what the bank did, but uh, first of all, compliments to our clients, uh, because it was not only the banks that had to react agile, 
I think a huge pressure was also on our clients and on the corporates. And that also reflects on the, the treasurer's business where they really had to step up and, uh, and, 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 and be more agile themselves. And so very big compliments to them. Um, if I look at what, uh, what the, the banks did, what ING did, yeah, first of all, I think continuity for our clients where we could help uh, was, was our most critical importance. Um, and what you, that, that, that showed in many uh, areas. Uh, for example, uh, both in consumer and business side, we saw people getting payment holidays. Eh? So if they have a loan, uh, yeah, stop the repayment for a while. Um, we saw, of course, a lot of customers coming in with uh, asking for new credit lines. Uh, and we looked into that, we supported them. We had additional teams on that. It was a huge focus in our front office and lending offices uh, in supporting the, the clients. And of course, third in that area, uh, the governments came in and stepped in with guarantee uh, type of loans. Uh, and in that area, both governments and banks and, and corporates work together to keep uh, the, the business for our corporates alive. And you mentioned already the, the digitalization, uh, which was a trend already, of course. But like someone said, it was not the CEO or the CIO uh, that made the real digital transformation. It was COVID-19 that led to it. And we saw really an acceleration. And we saw it, for example, in, uh, in payments in the shops, contactless payments, uh, limits were increased uh, to support clients. Um, for our customers who use our bank portals, we have tokens uh, to, for the security to log on to the system, but we also have a web token uh, based a mobile app uh, for on your phone. And in the past, we saw that it was quite a reluctance with, uh, well, about 75% of our customers to use that. But with everyone working from home, it was suddenly a real need from our customers, so we really could help them out there. And last but not least, especially in our domain, e-signing, which might be in the States uh, a bit further ahead, but in, in, in our area in Europe, it's not that far yet. And what we saw also is big progress there. So th those are just some examples where we had to step up, uh, both on the supporting, on the, yeah, keeping the business going, and on the other hand, making it more digital. Because in the end, uh, and there was a big achievement, both on client side and within the banks, Within a few weeks, everyone had to work from home, and that is a real big accomplishment. So uh, I would say uh, that's really asked for agile uh, way of working. Absolutely, it sounds like it really took a village. It wasn't just one product area or one area of bank. Everyone really needed to work together. Uh, Desiree, what about it at Webster Bank? I, you're located in North America. We're still seeing a lot of COVID cases here, but we're also seeing industry segments and industries being impacted in different ways. Uh, what strategies have worked for Webster Bank to help its clients in this current environment? Thank you, Christine. As Bert indicated, COVID-19 drove a lot. And similarly, it took the village of Webster as well as our clients and our end customers to meet that challenge. Within the Northeast of the United States, where our region is, we've had clients who had needs to make their entire payment cycle remote in a matter of days. And that was changing the interface between them and their customers. And then that payment vehicle then going into their GLs and then working with us and then getting access to that to their suppliers. And a lot of what Webster was able to do was, was able to take our basic functions and networks and platforms and create those interfaces. We had industries in the restaurant business and we had that had to change their whole business model and they needed us to partner with them to make that happen. We also had with you know, certain sectors that were dramatically impacted, travel was impacted services of, of conventions and was impacted. And the second piece of making our customers able to handle these challenges was us working with our government. There was a lot of government support. Bert mentioned it in, in his country. In the United States, there was a lot of funding that, that was being offered to our clients, to our, our corporate clients. And there was a lot of work that the banks did to connect to these governmental services to support the applications, to be able to then receive those funds. 
And this was all being built in real time. So our governments were also deploying treasury and technology people and using APIs. And I know we'll get to that later, but they were all doing this in real time. And so it, it really was wonderful to be a part of it. And it was gratifying to be able to have a purpose in supporting the mon movement of money that was really critical and in a need. And Webster is a smaller bank and I think we were able to have a connection with our government partners, with our clients and using the technology that we had to really meet the need. Yeah, it's been interesting. It really doesn't matter the size of the bank. So much has come down to uh, the bank's ability to change quickly. And a lot of that comes down to the technology platform that they have. Has a bank been making investments over the years to continually modernize their solution? If they have, in many cases, they've had an easier time. It's been challenging for everyone, uh, but the technology really has been critical and has made the difference between building and losing uh, loyal customers. So the recovery is likely to be slow and uneven across the globe. How are you seeing banks reorienting their strategies for these realities in corporate treasury? Sure. Uh, well, thanks for the question, Christine, and good morning to everybody. Uh, well, if you, if you just go back eight or nine months and look at the uh, impact COVID has had, uh, I mean, a lot of uh, about this has already been discussed, right? Uh, and a lot of most of it that we talked about has been very, very concerning. But let me start off by sharing a slightly brighter perspective here. Uh, a recent study by Greenwich Associates in Europe pointed out that fewer participants in that study said the impact of the second wave of COVID uh, was likely to be as negative as uh, the first wave. Uh, and very clearly the theme that was emerging uh, was uh, the, 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 uh, the COVID impact is going to be substantially moderated uh, over the next two or three quarters. So I think that's, that's definitely uh, a brighter sort of indicator for us to look at from a broader economy perspective. Uh, even if you look at the raw economic numbers, uh, we see the consumer discretionary spending or the consumer staples, healthcare, transportation spending, uh, all of that has increased. So in many ways, I, we think uh, the wheels have started to turn. Uh, this augurs well for both corporate clients as well as the banks. And we have started moving in the right direction. Of course, there's still uh, uh, some time for us to go, but we are definitely making moves in the right direction. Uh, if you dig a little deeper, uh, the way I see this is as, as you know, early go back February of, of previous year, uh, when, when the impact actually hit, um, we look at it in three different phases. The first one was the shock phase, and the second one was the response phase, and the third one was the reinvent phase. Um, in February, everybody was in the shock phase because most banks had prepared for something like a BCPDR, a disaster happening in one location. Nobody was really prepared for a disaster situation happening everywhere. So everyone was in that shock phase. Uh, but today, if you see, we see sort of a normal distribution uh, we see more banks in the response phase where they're trying to you know, use digitization to come out of it. And some of the innovators really have moved into the reinvent phase. Uh, reinvent phase. So that is, that is hugely a positive. So, and then that also sort of uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, leads to the same conclusion that we see based on the Greenwich uh, report that, uh, uh, that the impact of the second wave is likely to be significantly lower uh, than, than the first wave because more banks are just very well prepared. And, and as uh, Bert said earlier, uh, I think the reason why we believe uh, this is the case is because more banks have adopted digitization. Uh, and I like what he said earlier, COVID has forced some of the banks who are reluctant or dragging their feet towards digitization. So it is no longer a choice. It has been kind of mandated. So all in all, I think, yes, we are, we are better prepared. Uh, there are impacts that are going to be uh, felt, and of course, that's that's just unavoidable. But we are in a better position to be able to uh, face uh, the, uh, the second wave, and then later part of the year, we see that this kind of subsides. Uh, a real quick uh, comment that I wanted to make about uh, some of the things that we are doing well as well. Uh, in the shock phase, we were hit with the day-to-day -day operations part, and I think most people have, uh, uh, most corporates and banks have come out of this. 
Uh, they have figured a way to work around working from home, working remotely, though we do hear occasionally somebody's dog barking and all of that. So I think we do have, we have come out of that phase uh, very well. Um, uh, at, at this point, I think it's also fair for us to uh, acknowledge the fact that we all are fortunate enough to work in an industry that lets us work from home. Um, uh, I, I tip my hat to all the others who don't have that luxury and still keeping the economy going. So uh, a word of thanks to uh, all of the others who are actually not as fortunate and as blessed as us working in the technology or the banking space. Uh, the other couple of areas where I think we still, we have seen some improvement uh, is the liquidity side. Uh, what the situation was in February and March, well, the response that we get from corporate treasuries is they're getting far better data from their banks. So we have seen improvement in that. Uh, and then on the financing side, as Desiree said, there's some work to be done there because there are more and more governments who are coming in with no requirements. And, and some in some cases we see uh, the, the requirements are getting diluted because of the governments wanting to get credit faster to banks. This is something very different from what the banks had done in 2008. So I think there's some work to be done there. But again, uh, we are far better positioned to handle this, the second wave if it, if it is as bad as, as the first one. And the reason for that is because of digitization. I completely agree. And you know, I, I think that's a good segue to this next question from Bert, which is really, you know, it's important to also look at the positive coming out of this. And one positive for sure has been the acceleration of digital transformation. Banks have been talking about this forever, uh, but this really has lit a fire under the industry in many ways and really forced some of those banks that were on the fence or customers that were on the fence really uh, forced their hand toward digitization. Uh, so Bert, as you think about the top IT priorities for banks in treasury services right now, what would you say are the, the must haves um, for you know, banks to be able to deliver that digital and integrated experience that their customers now need and expect? Yeah, that, that is uh, indeed, you're right. I think uh, this, this pandemic uh, accelerated existing trends and uh, maybe the biggest change is in the restructuring of the trades, how, how trade the supply chain is managed, cross-border trades, uh, companies considering should we do uh, a, th a lot of things remote or should we bring things closer to home um, but if you say look at the top IT priorities well if you have a minute and uh, there are a few for the banks but I would like to connect it to the needs of our uh, of our clients uh, because of course there there are many uh, technical trends but if I look at the treasury needs, I would say they have needs on daily banking, they have, a, they have a needs on strategic funding and liquidity, they have a need on risk management, that's, and of course on maintenance and all the basics uh, that's there. If I, if I look in the daily banking area, one of the things that I really see coming uh, is, is becoming real time. For example, uh, if you want to have your cash position, your insights in your cash position, well, normally 24 hours is okay, but in the, uh, the months that are ahead of our in the past uh, are uh, uh, behind us um, and probably before us as well. You want to know now if a client has paid, if uh, money is coming in, yes or no. So I think that uh, the need for speed is uh, is really increasing. So real time uh, is, 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 and there's legislation going on, but uh, clients are asking. It. Second is um, we need to tailor it to the client needs uh, because every client is, and some examples are already mentioned uh, by my colleagues here, um, every client is in, is in a different uh, need and uh, so we can tailor uh, differentiation. For example, we started a pilot with one of our biggest retailers, the largest retailer in the Netherlands, about virtual cards where shopping becomes even more digital, more easier, uh, etc. Um, so I think uh, making things personal, easy, and smart, that's what we, uh, would lo uh, what we love to say, is, is very important. And for that, we need to know who our client is really, and more, more advanced, speak to the clients, and, uh, and really create digital end-to-end -end journeys. Um, for example, today, if you have to open an account, it might easily cost two months before you have it. Well, that should be preferably an hour, but more realistically, probably two days. And to do that, I think two items are very important. Um, digitalize KYC. Uh, KYC is one of the real burdens uh, if you want to open an account or open an, uh, 
have a new entity uh, to the bank. So uh, that's why, for example, ING is investing in a fintech uh, to, to, solve, to crack that nut to solve the problem. Uh, other initiatives might be on digitalization of accounts and virtual accounts. Uh, those are all kinds of initiatives going on. What it would need for a bank is to have a, well, more or less a tech platform, a tech platform that's platform oriented. For example, when we had to introduce the PSD2 regulation, which is the Payment Service Directive regulation in, um, in, in, in Europe, um, ING developed one global platform for business and consumers uh, for the APIs that are mandatory under the PSD2 regulation. And this, this is a platform that is now, is now ready. So we can build upon that and uh, in that sense, deliver um, with more speed new services to our customers and to countries. And that is a challenge to do that in so many countries in a bank that is, has historically grown from a lot of banks integrating and going forward with and no, not having an integrated IT landscape. So I think that was a big step forward and we need to extend that. You mentioned yourself already, advanced analytics, machine learning. It's very important to make offers uh, more personal and smart. If you look at uh, the, the, the strategic funding side for the clients, I would say the whole loan process uh, needs further digitalization and needs improved experience. And of course, real-time cash concentration and cash flow forecasting. And probably you can address cash flow forecasting later because there are some mixed messages to say there. And um, yeah, I think those are some examples where banks uh, are stepping up and really need to step up to support our clients. I think what clients may expect from us is that we make the journeys digital from end to end and not only a small part of it. It will go in steps, but the journey should be complete end to end. And Desiree, what about you? I'd like to ask you a similar question. How would you describe that, ex that ideal uh, corporate experience, digital experience, and how close do you feel banks are to being able to deliver it today? What we've experienced at Webster is that our corporate clients expect to have the same experience in their treasury management as they do in their consumer life. Uh, one of the things that Webster made the strategic investment is to replatform our digital experience for our commercial and treasury customers, enabling authorizations and treasury management tools to be visible, not just digitally on a PC in a corporate environment, but even working within their, their same company's protocols to enable it to be viewed on the phone. Uh, and I feel that the, as COVID-19 then escalated the curve to being remote and utilizing the functionality and technology of biometric authorizations and even now face recognition, which in the States is going kind of wonky because we're all wearing masks. So a lot of times our, our corporate clients are, they loved getting that feature and they felt like they only had it for a minute and then it became problematic because it doesn't work with their mask anymore. But that aside, what the optimal experience is that we're able to provide that digital interface at the points where our corporate clients are going to be at, the decision makers, and we deploy it in a way that still maintains the expectation of security. And so in the same way as we've enabled all of these digital touch points, we've also have to enable our ability to manage fraud and mitigate risk of unintended consequences. Yeah, that finding that right balance between usability and security is always a big challenge, but so critical for sure. And you asked me how close are banks to getting to that. Um, In the States, which is my, my purview, I would say that like many other elements of banking, it's really being developed on a use case basis and based on relationships. I don't think you can compare where banks are in supporting their treasury services to the same way that where Amazon is at delivering books or even cloud computing. Um, 
And I think though there is opportunity in leaping the, the curve, so to speak, because we are so trusted and have such experience navigating all the payment networks and supporting a digital experience for our clients, I do think that that gives us the opportunity to create those tailored experiences. And I think that we're gonna be doing that so many times that we're gonna create a new norm, but I don't think we're there yet. I would agree, but I think those experiences in our personal lives really have raised the bar uh, for sure. And it, it is putting some pressure on banks to start to look like an Amazon to the degree uh, that they can. Um, Raul, let's talk a little bit about the importance of treasury centralization. Uh, so there was a, a recent study of treasury professionals. This one happened to be in Europe around the time of the, the start of the pandemic. And they asked about some of the challenges around centralization. And some of the key challenges listed were fragmentation, lack of standardization and processes, uh, bank relationships, account structures, and then the technology platforms themselves. What is Infosys doing to help its bank customers uh, overcome some of those common industry challenges in the area of centralization? Yeah, right. It's an it's been an age old problem, right? Uh, and I think as as uh, Desiree uh, put it, uh, the experience in commercial banking technology, uh, be it in the United States or in Europe, has always historically lacked vis-a-vis uh, -vis the consumer banking experience for for different reasons. Uh, but uh, that's just been uh, a, a, a fact. I mean, just to give you an example, um, if you look at your consumer credit card experience uh, with with a bank, and then if you happen to have a commercial bank, commercial card with the same bank, the experiences are totally different. And, and of course, they're valid reasons. They have to look at more commercial products. Uh, the technologies are different. The applications are different. Regulations are different, all of that. But also then the experience is significantly different. Um, so what we see uh, when we talk to banks here is uh, suddenly banks realize this, that there is a problem, and then they tend to get into a catch-up mode. And they want to invest in the digital front end system and, and suddenly try to build some kind of a wrapper on top of their old infrastructure. Uh, and we always tell them that uh, this kind of a catch up mode approach always ends up being uh, like a you know, uh, lipstick on a pig kind of a situation. And it doesn't give you the experience that you're looking for. So you just cannot build a wrapper on top of your old infrastructure it will not, it will, yeah, it will definitely create pretty screens, but that's not what you're after. That's not what your consumers want. They want that experience. If you're looking for experience, what you're really looking for is digitizing inside out or what we call digitizing the core. And that's what really creates, we believe, uh, a solid foundation for your digital channels to create that experience. Uh, so when we, we offer cash management solutions front to back to our customers, we tend to create that phase-wise approach for transformation. Start with either your digital channels, then your middleware, and then your backend technology, depending on what your uh, technology or digital maturity uh, within the bank is. But basically, the approach is it's a phase-wise transformation approach, starting from front to back, and that's what we believe creates uh, an end-to-end -end digitized experience uh, across all lines of businesses, payments, liquidity, and all of that. Um, and that also uh, the whole um, the whole whole concept that we are moving towards, uh, Christine is this, uh, this theme of treasury on demand. And that's what, you know, it is, it is, uh, it's the experience that gets created. Uh, you're giving real time information, you're giving real transaction information. Uh, Bert talk about, uh, talks about analytics. So you're giving real time analytics uh, to your consumers to create that, uh, that uh, the, those decisions, take those decisions. Uh, and that's what we believe uh, the future is. So again, to just quickly summarize, uh, we are we advise a phase-wise transformation, front to back or back to front, whichever way, depending on your investments, depending upon each bank's technology maturity in the organization. But you always have to take an end-to-end -end approach. You cannot just put in some screens in the front end and expect to get the same uh, experience that your customers uh, are looking for. I completely agree with that. I speak with so many banks that they have 30 year old core systems on the back end. And even though they have something modern in the front, they, the level of integration isn't there. And 
that importance of taking a page of notes, lower risk um, it is so important. So another challenge that we, I commonly hear from corporate treasurers, and Bert, this question's for you, you already touched on it a little bit before, and that's the area of for, uh, cash flow forecasting. Um, in the current environment with so much uncertainty, so many of the, the pre-pandemic models that were created aren't really valid. Uh, so what are the additional considerations that corporates really need to be aware of in, in this environment? Yeah. Um, yeah, first of all, I was still thinking about what Rahul said. Uh, if I may, uh, just a second on that one. Uh, I, I think I agree with him that preferably you would start from front to back uh, and, and renew everything. Uh, unfortunately, uh, my daily experience is that that is hardly possible, especially if you are a large bank. And uh, But if you're small, you have other challenges. Um, so I think I hope the technology enables us to really make that experience also in the legacy landscape uh, from front to back. Uh, and I'm, I'm hopeful on that. Uh, I, I, I see a lot of things happening. Um, we can't wait for the ideal world. Uh, we have to also to do it. And of course, we need to renew where we do. We are doing that. And, uh, but we also have to make tactical choices. Uh, otherwise, uh, our clients would have to wait too long. But having said that, um, back to cash flow forecasting. To be honest, this topic is one of the th topics that um, is difficult and not difficult to crack uh, in general. I think the, the, the request for a good cash flow forecasting is in the top three of treasurers for the last five years, 10 years, I don't know. It's every year in the top three. Sometimes it's one, sometimes it's three. And if you really speak with clients, how much have you invested on it? They run into a lot of difficult uh, problems and they postponed investments in it. So there's a catch 22 here. Um, because I believe that uh, real good cash flow forecasting, real automated cash flow forecasting is, um, is expensive to set up and is really profitable to run for the longer term. The question is, uh, do you get the priority within your organization as a, as a treasurer uh, to, to make these kind of investments going forward? However, this is the moment to, to push it forward because what we saw and when I spoke with clients, um, yeah, the question is, do you get the speech you need uh, for your cash flow forecasting? Um, I, I mentioned it already in the beginning, I think, uh, is uh, you want to know now, especially when there's a crisis, you want to know if somebody has paid or not or before you deliver or whatever. So becoming real time, I think real time cash flow forecasting becomes uh, even more imminent than it was before. And I'm quite sure that a lot of treasurers had to report much more often to their board uh, than they had to do in the past. So um, I would say that um, real time uh, is, is priority one that you add that so that you add real time information to your uh, to the art. I think visibility of funds, optimize control and be predictable and forecast is, is, is in need of all ages. And um, what could help and what we see is that helping is the virtual accounts uh, business and virtual, especially virtual cash management, not, not only virtual accounts, um, but virtual cash management. For example, we launched, ING is a front runner in Europe on this topic. Uh, we launched a solution where you could do real time cash pooling, real time cash pooling cross border. Uh, as far as I'm aware, not any bank does have that in the moment. So, what we see with our clients when they have that. They can still have multiple accounts because sometimes they need accounts in multiple countries because of tax reasons or legal reasons or whatever. Um, and they can do it in this way easier and faster. And because they have to cash still in one place, but are operationally able to have a distributed uh, view to support all their operating companies locally, um, I think it helps them in the cash flow forecasting because they have the real, uh, real insight. Um, last week we had a presentation. IG invests in a, in one in a fintech, uh, work on uh, predicting uh, production and predicting cash flow. Um, and when you talk with a customer, it's not only about banks providing better tooling. It's also about the culture in the company. Do you really want to organize more centrally? And uh, all the ERP systems that you have internally, are you able 
to unlock all the data in your own organization and to bring it to the central tool? And then do you have a tool that supports it on an entity level or that supports it multilingual or that it immediately has a link to FX trading because insight is one, but you have to act on it. So um, I think that that is where we are. So again, already top, ten, top three for the last years. I hope that this period learns that we uh, have to step up here and that both clients and banks uh, will invest in it uh, furthermore. I think they will, at least based on conversations I'm having. I agree it's been important for a while, but that level of urgency seems to increase. Um, the big question I hear all the time is, who's the one responsible for the forecasting? Should it be the bank offering the tools or is it just providing the information to these third party systems that um, corporate treasurers are using? And I, I think the answer to that question depends on the size of the end user. I think it's very different from a small or medium sized business versus a, a large corporate. Uh, but you know, that leads us into you know, a, a, another area um, that we keep hearing a lot about and that's APIs. Uh, again, not a new topic. APIs have been around for a while, but I think the industry has seen some new use cases for them. Uh, and Desiree, I'd like to hear a little bit about Webster, what Webster Bank is doing uh, as far as innovation in, in the API space. When we were talking before about how banks, large or mid-sized like Webster, have legacy core systems that they're integrating together, uh, there does come a point where your ability to leverage APIs is really hampered by that. And so what Webster has done and has committed to do is really focusing on our core systems and making that conversion to cloud-based computing and environments. And as we do that, even before, even before we, 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 we made that investment, we had APIs or um, interface layers that we use to connect our systems. And I think there's that phase of innovation. And then there's the, what we expose to our clients. So our, you know, and then, and something you mentioned earlier, Christine, about the size of the client matters. So as we deliver these services and expose our financial services to smaller mid-size clients, their needs and their IT organizations and their desires to have APIs are very different than our much larger commercial clients. And so we've had a bifurcated approach where we really leveraged APIs as part of our evolution of our core and exposing services within all the many places within Webster. And then we've been very selective about how we then commoditize that bundle of financial services and then expose APIs to clients. So I'd say Webster's definitely in our focus is in the former group. And we see really partnerships with our platform partners and our technology partners partnering with their existing solutions is how we really are delivering it to our clients. I agree. There, there really are different ways to look at APIs and that use within the organization and then what you make available uh, to the customers. Another older product that we're seeing a resurgence in is interest and innovation around virtual accounts. And, and Bert brought this up, but Raul, I'm curious to hear about some of the innovation at, at Infosys around uh, virtual accounts. So things like multi-bank or multi-currency or autonomous uh, virtual accounts. They're really creating enhanced propositions for large corporates, especially the ones with global operations. So what types of strategies are you seeing banks implementing in these areas and how is Infosys helping them? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the whole uh, development around virtual account management uh, has really kept us busy in the last whatever, about 36 to 48 months. Uh, see, reconciliation has always been a big issue for corporate treasurers, right? And I think that is what, that this is where uh, I believe uh, virtual account management came in. It's still relatively new in North America. We see banks are still trying to uh, get to the concept and, and things like that, but it's been used for a pretty long time in Asia and, and Europe. Um, so um, I, I think, I mean, if I were to just give an example, I mean, I was, I was talking to um, somebody uh, in Europe, one of the largest 
broadcasting companies uh, possibly in the world with the widest operations. Uh, one of their, just, just, to, just as an example to showcase the utility of WAF, um, the, the, the company's biggest problem, the corporate's biggest problem was they had thousands and thousands of producers and teams all over the world uh, working with different correspondent banks that that uh, that uh, that were there in those regions, and all the teams were pushing in expenses and getting payments through different banks, uh, and all of the eventual transactions were getting routed to the same physical account. So it was a nightmare. They had a huge department just to facilitate reconciliation across all these transactions that are coming in from different teams in different regions. They implemented a virtual account solution and made that made a life a lot easier for them. So just, just for benefit of those who don't know or who are probably new to what virtual account is, it creates an ability uh, to create virtual categorizations for transactions that are coming in. So you can create virtual buckets uh, based on the type of transaction, geography that's coming in, the group or the unit that is pushing in that transaction, the currency, uh, any any such parameters that you want. So everything is actually going into the same physical account, but now you have a set of virtual buckets or categorizations uh, where the transaction sits, and then you can give user accesses and you can run different reconciliation rules on those individual buckets. So tremendously useful tool from a corporate reconciliation standpoint. Uh, this is this is where I think this is really going to be one of the key uh, differentiators uh, for this. Uh, even in a regular setup, what we saw, what corporates are doing now is trying to sort of create a standard virtual account structure and then just cut and paste it or deploy it in multiple regions so as to create a level of standardization in their overall chart of accounts. So, so those, there are several sort of, you know, uh, ways corporates are, are using it and we are supporting them. Uh, another uh, way um, critical uh, sort of uh, experience that I had, and I'm sure many of us who have been in banking for a while would have known, just take one one bank that I was talking to, they wanted to use virtual accounts for correspondent banking setup, for managing their Nostro accounts. And the reason why they said was, well, they have they have all transactions, their, their, their correspondent banks are pushing in transactions. Uh, some of them are trade transactions, other supply chain payments, consumer, everything going into one account. They, they envisage the use of virtual accounts to basically create separate buckets for these banks. Again, going into the single physical account, virtual buckets in the front to basically neatly sort of organize transactions coming in from different, different groups. Uh, there was another bank that used, uh, they were thinking of using virtual accounts for managing commercial escrow uh, transactions. So the, 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 the beauty, really, if I can use that word, of virtual accounts, I feel, is it's not necessarily a cash management product. It's not necessarily only a payments product. It is, it, yes, it did have its roots or it probably originated in payments and cash management, but the applications of virtual accounts are absolutely numerous. And, yeah. and uh, this has brought down the reconciliation time. This has brought, this has made life significantly easier for several of our corporates, accounts receivable and accounts payable department. And I think this is this is definitely going to be one of the key sort of uh, requirements that most banks are going to hear uh, when they when they start uh, you know from from their corporates. So uh, Christine, uh, uh, really an innovative product, been in, used in Asia for a long time. We are recently seeing a significant level of interest in this uh, in US, uh, and and then of course Europe has been using it for a while. Uh, but this is this is really sort of a game changer in cash management. I would agree, and I've observed the same thing. The U.S. is lagging a little bit, uh, but we are seeing increased interest, especially amongst larger uh, banks. But the opportunities for innovation and new use cases uh, really are numerous, as you said. So it'll be an interesting space to keep an eye on uh, going forward. So, so far, we've talked mostly about corporate treasurers. We haven't talked too much about uh, smaller businesses. So, Bert, I'd like to ask you um, a question about that. You know, the small businesses are becoming a lot more commercially focused or, or needing more than just consumer products. Uh, and banks are focusing a lot more attention on them today, but they need platforms that are able to scale to meet the needs of a large corporate and a, a smaller business. How prepared do you feel that cash management platforms are to be able to 
uh, be able to drive this differentiated multi-segment offering. Yeah, that is, uh, maybe Desiree could add it because you have more experience in the business banking space than, uh, than I have, uh, I would say. But what I see is that um, in, in the smaller SME markets, uh, it depends a bit on the, how, how the, 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 the company is organized, uh, how, how structured they, they are. What I see is that uh, most of those clients operate locally in one country and my, my, my uh, area is Europe, so with uh, 21, 25 uh, different countries with all the leg legislation. Most of the companies work domestic and what we see is multiple domestic initiatives varying from just Excel-based solutions, which by the way is one of the things we need to explore further also for large corporates because every controller or treasurer dreams in Excel, I believe. Um, and, um, but I also see that there's a need also for multi-bank information in the, in the smaller space. So what I see is that uh, um, there are fintechs stepping up and ING deliberately choose to invest in a few or start a few fintechs like Yolt or Casey or Cobase to deliver multi-bank solutions, especially for this part of the market. Um, if, a, if a company in SME or mid-corporate becomes more international, he probably also needs other, other functionality. And then you can see they can use our uh, platform that we have for the larger corporates as well, because that's scalable up to your needs uh, for one country, for 20 countries, whatever you would need. And um, so I would say that if you look at cash management, um, and what I see is that all additional services, because if I say cash management, I mean cash pooling, payments, etc. But I also see that in many countries, people think of additional services to, uh, to take away burden from uh, the smaller companies. Yeah. Definitely. And this is where the platform flexibility uh, really comes in because a small business may need some commercial type capabilities, but in a much more scaled down level or, or lower volumes. But they, their needs are becoming a lot more sophisticated than getting them onto those business platforms makes it easier for the bank to grow with them. Uh, so there's definitely a strong business case for having that platform uh, that scales. A another topic that we haven't really um, talked much about yet is real-time payments. Um, there's mandates in, in some parts of the world, does right here in the US where uh, we're not seeing that, but we're seeing a lot more use cases uh, for real-time or, or faster payments um, it, it's really starting to build momentum. COVID really has helped to create some use cases. So I'm just curious, your thoughts on uh, the impact of RTP uh, going forward for cash management. Yes, real-time payments, the RTP platform is one which has seen a lot of growth and adoption, especially as a result of COVID-19. And that adoption has been helped by partners and platforms connecting to RTP, which allows banks to participate at a greater pace. I think that is the sort of evolution that's necessary and that banks are now able to use an RTP network to deliver real-time settlement of dollars to their clients. Before that, we were basing it on trust between banks. Mm -hmm. And I think as we have stronger consolidation with the regulatory bodies and the real-time networks that are available, I think the use cases will just grow. I completely agree. We, as we speak with banks, we're hearing more and more use cases for it, stronger use cases to, to motivate banks, customers to use this. And then of course it goes along those same lines of that need for speed that's come up in so many times during uh, this discussion as a, an expectation of customers. Um, this next question is always a, a fun one to ask because I always get different responses and actually I've seen an evolution of responses over time. Uh, and I'm going to ask this question to you, Rahul. Um, the role of emerging fintechs, they've been mentioned a, a few times. Sometimes I, I hear banks describing them as disruptors, other times they're partners. Uh, what's your thoughts about these emerging fintechs? Are they partners, disruptors, competitors, all of the above? Well, I think I'll go with all of the above, uh, Christine, mm -hmm. to be perfectly honest. Uh, I, I think uh, what uh, the, the, the mantra here really is collaboration more than competition takes us all and our clients further than what we all individually would. And I think that's the theme uh, that is very, very important 
uh, when we talk about fintechs and banks and existing vendors. Uh, but what I feel uh, was very important beyond, and we'll talk about the niche areas that they operate in and all of that, what fintech did uh, that was very important from uh, for everybody was uh, they added, they made it okay for banks to work with really small vendors. They made it okay for banks to work with somebody who didn't have a large client base. I mean, flashback five or six years when, you know, uh, uh, before the uh, fintech scene exploded, banks, the, one of the first questions that banks always wanted to uh, ask was, well, how many, what's your client base? Uh, what's your total revenue? How big are you? Uh, you know, can we actually put that faith in you as a vendor? I think that perception changed. I'm not saying that's all gone. I mean, it's still there. Uh, but but again, as I said, it, the whole whole idea, it made it okay for banks to work with a, a, a very small company with, uh, with very few uh, entrepreneurial uh, folks uh, with a great idea. And that was that, that's the big difference that came in. Uh, before that, the only way you could actually put a cool functionality, innovative feature into the system was either for the banks to do it themselves or to come to vendors like us uh, and then you know, expect us to deliver it in the product. But even for someone like us, uh, I mean, it does take time considering product and, and roadmaps and, and our development process. So FinTech did bring in that agility. So I think, um, and then they again have a niche area that they operate in. It helped us sort of uh, more um, concentrate on our core competency instead of trying to go around in multiple spaces, trying to do a little bit of everything that the bank wanted. Uh, but what it also, when I say it helped us con uh, concentrate on our core competency, what it forced vendors like us to do was take a more API-centric approach, take a more microservices approach, because what was very evident is now we are going to be part of a broader ecosystem. We may be the dominant player in that ecosystem, and we would have several different fintechs that would be working alongside us. Uh, and our applications need to be that much more agile. They need to be able to interact that much more with not just one, but multiple fintechs that the bank could be working with. And that really, you know, that was a big impact from us. So for us, uh, not a competition. We look at them as partners. Uh, we, we just believe that we're all part of the same ecosystem, which is trying to bring in value to the bank and the bank's customers. I agree. I do think it's a win-win situation have these partnerships and to work together. Unfortunately, that brings us to the end of what I believe was a great discussion. A big thank you to each of the panelists. We are so grateful for your time and all of the great insights that you've been sharing with us during this discussion. Also, a thank you to all of the attendees for making the time to attend the session. I hope it was useful and I hope that each of you walks away with some new insights to bring to your organization. Uh, feel free to come back to view the recording and keep an eye out uh, for an email from the Finical team that will include a link to the video that you can feel free to share with your colleagues. I hope you'll stay tuned to Finical Conclave and enjoy all of the high quality speakers and discussions that are lined up for you. Goodbye and stay safe.